Good morning. My name is Joe Beatty. I'm the research supervisor for the North Carolina Office of Archives and History, and I'm uh, glad to welcome you today to uh, another conversation in our series we call Flyleaf uh, from the Office of Historical Publications and Research, where we're talking with authors and friends of our office about the interesting work uh, that they've been doing and that we're able to share. Today, I'm glad to have uh, Thomas Jepson with me. We're talking about uh, his article in, uh, in the North Carolina Historical Review. And, and Tom, I'm gonna turn it over to you for a second to uh, introduce yourself and to um, uh, say hi. Thank you, Joe. I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the article. And uh, I, I think I'm looking forward to a, to a stimulating discussion. Excellent. Um, the, your article about the, the history of the Weather Service, the National Weather Service in, in, uh, uh, in North Carolina is fascinating. It appears uh, in the April issue uh, of the Historical Review. And I want to, um, I guess I first wanna ask, um, how did you become interested in this topic? Well, there's, there's a story there. Uh, in the past, I have largely worked as, as a historian of technology and I've written several books about the telegraph and particularly the role of women in the telegraph industry in the, in the, in the 19th and 20th centuries. And a few years ago, I, I realized that no one had ever written a uh, history of the telegraph in North Carolina. So I began putting together an article about the origins of the telegraph uh, service in North Carolina, which dates back to the Samuel Morse days. The first line went through North Carolina actually in 1848, wow. uh, connecting Raleigh and, and Fayetteville. Uh, but in part of my research for that article, which ended up being published in, in a different publication, the Journal of the North Carolina Association of Historians, uh, as part of my research, I came across an interesting little tidbit of information that I recalled from a public television program I'd seen some years ago. It was about the renovation of the Hatteras Weather Station and the fact that in the course of remodeling that uh, weather station down, at, down in Hatteras, they had found a bunch of telegrams stuffed in the wall. And you know, this attracted my attention. Why on earth were they stuffing telegrams in the wall of the weather station? And so this literally led me off on a whole journey of exploration, learning about the origins of the weather service in North Carolina, how it came to be there, and how the, the telegraph was used to link all these weather stations that were developed along the coast of North Carolina, beginning as early as 1870 and continuing up uh, until well into the 20th century. So this uh, basically set me off on, uh, on a whole new direction in my, in my research and one that uh, uh, proved to be quite fruitful, quite, quite interesting. Well, that's a great connection you make between the, your interest in the telegraph and then making the leap to weather because I don't think we normally would connect those things, right? I mean, how do you find out about the weather and then how do you share that information, which I guess is ultimately sort of the goal of, uh, of the weather service, of course, but you know, how, uh, how people take interest in the weather, you know, as we were talking a moment ago, I think the quote that's attributed to Mark Twain that everyone talks about the weather, but nobody seems to do anything about it. Um, it seems that learning and sharing that information is, is really important. Can you riff a little bit more on this uh, information about the telegraph? Because that seems like a really crucial part of this. Yeah. Well, actually, the, the, the thing that jumped out at me in, in doing this research is how essential the telegraph was way back when in, in the 19th century to actually doing weather forecasting for the first time. But before you had the telegraph and the ability to move information at, at, at lightning speed from place, place to place, there's no way that you could really assemble any sort of a comprehensive view of the weather and uh, create enough information to, to enable you to make forecasts. So the telegraph really enabled early weather forecasting. And from the earliest days of, of the telegraph from the 1850s on, uh, uh, they were already beginning to report uh, weather by telegraph because then you could get information early enough for it to make a difference. If you were uh, observing the weather in one part of the country and relaying it, say, on, on horseback to another part of the country, by the time that information got there, it was too late. Right. So the, it, really, you can look at the use of the telegraph in the 19th century being an early example of what we call big data today. 
uh, of, of data analysis where you can gather data from all these different points in the country and compile them in, in a single location and, uh, and begin to make some, some, literally to make some sense out of it. Uh, what are the trends? Which direction is the weather moving? What are the critical factors that, uh, that uh, enable you to forecast the weather? And you begin to develop these concepts of isobars and isotherms that, that meteorologists use these days to indicate areas of similar barometric pressure or temperature and, and, and you begin to be able to see how they're moving in a given direction and what's gonna happen somewhere else tomorrow based on this information. So the telegraph was essential for, for the whole concept of weather forecast. You know, that's, really, that's really cool. And I love the idea of, of this being the, the origin or uh, yeah, I guess the origin or one of the first moves toward big data, I can imagine folks yeah. sitting down next to their telegraphs, scribbling, uh, jotting information down into big ledger books and then crunching it later uh, yeah. by hand. That sounds... Yeah. yeah, once you could assemble it, you, you could do that. And it's important to note too, that the telegraph, although it's not as well known as some of the other media today, I mean, that happened a long time ago and people have forgotten about it. It's, it's essentially the ancestor of all of our modern digital technology because out of the telegraph emerges the telephone, uh, the radio, television, and of course, today's modern internet. And uh, the telegraph was, was the, the digital ancestor of all of those services that we, that we use so commonly in day-to-day -day life today. That's pretty cool. Um, can, you mentioned in the article a little bit about um, the cultural conflict between um, uh, weather folkloric, you say folkloric weather wisdom um, and this new technology. Can you talk a little bit about um, how people were attempting to or what kind of wisdom they were relying on before this innovation and then um, what happens after or is, if there is a conflict in there? Sure. Um, and in fact, there, this is happening on several different levels. Uh, if you look before the advent of modern weather forecasting and, and the use of the telegraph to report this information, people simply had to rely on, on folklore and, and, and wisdom, uh, uh, you know, about whether the sky was red in the evening or the morning and whether the sailors should beware the next day based on that. Uh, so th this is happening on several different levels. At, at an, a, a folkloric level, at, at the level of the average person, uh, weather was was construed as a, as basically a God given phenomenon. It was something you had no control over, and you just had to simply accept that the weather was was what it was. And the notion that you could somehow forecast it uh, was was quite a, a shock to people at, at this time. It took a long time really to persuade people that it was possible to gather this kind of information and 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 predict the weather. Uh, in the future. So th there's, there's a, a real cultural shock involved in the acceptance of, of weather forecasting by ordinary people. But even at the scientific level, uh, among weather scientists uh, at the time, uh, whether there was a real debate until well into the, the late 19th, early 20th century, is weather simply a chaotic system that is not predictable? Or are there principles that, that we can apply to, to weather forecasting that will enable us to, to give a, uh, an accurate picture of, of the weather moving forward. And uh, Willis Moore, for, uh, who was uh, Weather Bureau chief from the 1890s on, he started out as being a skeptic. He didn't believe that uh, uh, weather forecasting was possible. And in fact, at one time, evidently, he referred to it as a form of quackery. But eventually he, he became a believer and, and largely based on the, the ability of this telegraphic network that they set up to, uh, to provide information uh, and, and, and bring it together at a, at a centralized point in, in Washington, DC. So, yeah. that, that's terrific. You know, I, I love this idea that, uh, um, that weather might we associate, I think, weather today with being highly scientific and the idea that it was chaotic and, and wasn't even understandable is, uh, is a really great idea. Um, we've talked a little bit about the philosophy of weather, I guess. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about the mechanical aspects of the weather service in, in North Carolina about um, 
how whether how information was collected and transmitted. Maybe we can start there and, and build out our network, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, that's 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 a good point. Yeah, North Carolina was kind of an anomalous situation, but it was it was clearly a target of of the newly formed uh, signal service. Uh, it was basically to to go back a little bit. Uh, weather forecasting in the U.S. and the development of the weather network began with the creation of the military signal service in 1870 under General Albert Meyer, who was a, a former Civil War general who had been the head of the Signal Corps in during the Civil War. And uh, after the war was, was attempting to find a mission for his organization. Well, during the war, they had basically done military signaling, a lot of it by, by flag, uh, flag signaling and that sort of thing. He had a background as a telegrapher, and he thought this would be a great way to build a weather network and a good way to put his signal, core, signal service people to work. So he got permission from Congress to organize a, a series of weather stations linked together by the, te the telegraph that would be staffed by military personnel. And at each station, you would have a set of instruments to measure uh, rainfall, barometric pressure, uh, wind speed, and, and things like this. And the North Carolina coast was a particular area of interest because so much shipping went by and the conditions were particularly treacherous off the coast because of the various shoals and so forth. So it was an, one of the important aspects of this was to uh, build some stations along the North Carolina coast so they could report weather on the Atlantic and uh, give warnings, uh, storm warnings to ships at sea and so forth and, and provide weather information for the rest of the country. Problem was there was no telegraph on the Outer Banks at that time and the uh, Western Union and the other big companies didn't see any value in running lines along this, this, these barren uh, uh, barrier structures out, off the coast and because there, were, there wasn't that much business to be done out there. There weren't that many people. So the, the signal service built its own telegraph network on the Outer Banks and built the stations, the weather stations along the Outer Bank and, and, and built that portion of the, of the network themselves. Uh, and, and each station would report, the stations in North Carolina on the Outer Banks would all report up to Norfolk, Virginia. And from Norfolk, that information would be provided, would be sent on to Washington, D.C., where it would be evaluated along with the other information. And there were originally in, in 1870, about 25 stations throughout the U.S. in various locations, many of them in settled areas uh, so the, the Outer Banks area was kind of unusual in that it was not terribly populated at the time, and the weather conditions were far harsher than they were in, in a lot of the other areas. So that, that made it unique in, in, in one sense right there. That must have been quite an assignment for a, a military crew to, to uh, be stationed out on the Outer Banks reporting on the weather in the, in the 1880s. Oh yes, and, and 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 many of them complained bitterly about it. Uh, that this was considered to be really severe. In fact, it was considered uh, being sent to the outer banks to dig holes for telegraph poles was considered a, a form of, of punishment for bad behavior. Uh, and yeah, many of them uh, complained about the weather conditions and and asked for transfers to sunnier areas and and that sort of thing. But yeah, it, it was a, a rough duty assignment to, to go out there. Uh, poles were continually being washed away in hurricanes, wires were being struck by lightning. So you were continually having to maintain and, and repair the, the, the lines that were out there. In addition to simply reporting the weather, which was your basic function. Sure. The equipment and the the metrics that they're using, barometric pressure, wind speed, um, temperature, wind direction, these kinds of things sound uh, like the same sort of data that people are collecting today. Um, how was, so if, if the signal crew or if the, uh, uh, the crew is out there manning the weather station, collecting this data, they're sending it by telegraph. Is this, um, you mentioned something about uh, subterranean or, underwater cables in, uh, in your article is, can you describe to us, you, you say some of this goes to Norfolk, uh, where else are these cables reaching and, and, and uh, what are the challenges that these folks are facing? That's, that's a great question too. The, the, 
the art actually of, of laying submarine telegraph cables is actually pretty well advanced by the time that uh, they began doing this on the Outer Banks. You know, one of, one of the, the great stories in telegraph history is, is the laying of the Atlantic cables, which they began in as early as 1858, although that one didn't last very long. But they finally, in 1866, were able to put a cable across the, the Atlantic that connected Europe and the United States. And by 1870, all of the inhabited continents were connected by submarine telegraph cables. So you, you, you had basically a global network as early as 1870 that could send messages pretty, pretty quickly from continent to continent. The technology that, it, that evolved, though, was, was pretty tricky. When you're, you're laying a, a cable, first of all, the cable has to be very well insulated because it not only has to be electrically insulated from the salt water, it also needs to be able to protect the cable from, from tides and riptides and, and all the things that go on at the bottom of the ocean or, or the bottom of the sound for that matter. Uh, you had to play it out very carefully. The, the, the mechanisms for playing the cable out uh, had to regulate the pressure because if you, if you let it out too fast or too slowly, the cable could snap, it could snag on something and that's the end of the cable. It's down there in the muck somewhere. And uh, so they, they developed a lot of technology that enabled them to lay cables uh, uh, in these areas. Um, and I know, I strongly suspect that, and this is one thing that, that I, I looked into when I was doing my research, I suspect there are still some of those submarine cables under the sand there across some of those sounds, Oregon Inlet and Ocracoke and that. They're down there somewhere probably. And uh, someday somebody will pull them up and wonder what they are. Right. right. Sounds like we should take a field trip. <laughs> um, it it sounds like you're describing uh, a situation that is um, reliable, well, potentially reliable when everything goes well. But you mm -hmm. know, like you say, a hurricane comes through and washes out your poles or your wires, and uh, and you have trouble. Um, how did the the Weather Service embrace wireless technology and, and how did they start? Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the, the mm. advent of radio in this process? Yep. Yeah, well, there was, of, of course, there, there, there was an ongoing evolution of the technology because of these problems they faced. Uh, the, the telegraph wires would be struck by lightning, the, the poles would wash away. So they were continually experimenting with new technologies that would make it a bit easier to get information from these weather stations. Uh, you know, one of the earlier ones they experimented with was iron telegraph poles because they could not be washed away as easy. They wouldn't float. So a lot of the, the, the poles were, wooden poles were replaced with iron. But by about the time around 1900, you have uh, Marconi and similar people experimenting with, with wireless, which we call radio today. And the Weather Bureau got interested in this because, of course, if you could send reports by radio, then you wouldn't need this whole apparatus of, of the telegraph lines and everything that needed to be maintained and the submarine cables that kept washing away. Uh, they hired an experimenter, Reginald Fessenden, to build some experimental stations. And he had one in, in Manteo and another one down in Hatteras where he experimented uh, around 1900 with the possibility of sending uh, weather reports via wireless from one station to another. He had actually been employed by uh, the, the Weather Bureau under its chief Willis Moore at that time. And, uh, and basically what he was being asked to do was can he come up with a reliable method of, of, of communication between the Hatteras station and Norfolk? Can you send information directly from one to the other? Uh, Fessenden maintained several times, of course he could. He had the technology to make that work. Unfortunately, he never did make it work reliably. Uh, there, are, there are technical reasons why that is. His, his uh, equipment was kind of fragile and, and th these are, this is a pretty rough environment for it to work in. Mm -hmm. And he hadn't taken into account the fact that you, during significant parts of the year, you have a lot of static, uh, radio static, that is gonna interfere with the, the, uh, the, the sending of signals. In addition to this, there were political problems. Uh, the one thing that Fessenden and his boss, Willis Moore, had in common, they both had very large egos. And they both wanted to take credit for this, you know, and, and, and uh, Fessenden was, was not particularly 
honest about his successes or his failures, actually. And he, he, he boasted successes that never actually happened. Moore, on the other hand, saw that uh, imp uh, implementing this service would be a feather in his cap, and he was already lobbying to be the next Secretary of Agriculture. And uh, he was really disappointed that Fessenden didn't, didn't come through. So it, the whole thing ended in 1902 with one of these standoffs where Willis Moore said, you're fired, and Fessenden said, I quit. Uh, so that was, that was kind of the end of, of that. But now, this was the beginning, though, of... of uh, a different era uh, uh, in, in wireless. Uh, the, the Weather Bureau was not the only organization that thought this was a great idea. The Navy was very interested because obviously wireless was the one way you could communicate to ships at sea uh, while they're out there. And, and uh, if they could get that to work, then, uh, then this would be a big boon to them. So, so eventually what happened was the, the Navy basically took away the, the, the development of wireless talk telegraphy from the Weather Bureau and, and began to develop it on the own. Uh, the Weather Bureau, though, which still saw the value of having that, began to contract with private wireless companies. And one of the main ones they contacted with, contracted with was the Marconi Wireless Company. And, and Marconi had a station on the Outer Banks uh, very early on, probably is, is, well, definitely 1912, but there was one there even earlier than that. Uh, built by a different company. That incidentally, the whole story of wireless on the Outer Banks and its connection with uh, uh, ship to shore communication is something that I'm working on now. There's a, a lot of very interesting things to say about that. The competition for wireless on the Outer Banks, whole other story. I can only imagine that. that's got to be a fascinating uh, examination there. Um, you mentioned agriculture in that it makes me wonder, you know, part of the, uh, this enterprise of doing weather is not just a, it's not a vanity project, you know, mm -hmm. that you hope that the information that you collect has an impact. Um, can you, can you tell us a little bit about some of the uh, impacts of this weather reporting that, um, that the weather station here in North Carolina or the weather service here in North Carolina was able to provide? What did that do for people? Uh, one of the most valuable uh, uses of this weather information, of course, was was to farmers who who had to know what the the if uh, the, the weather was going to be like, when they should plant crops, when they should harvest them, and so forth. So the farmers and agriculture in general were were the big consumers of this weather information as the Weather Bureau developed it in the late 19th century. And and, and one really interesting uh, fact I ran across in doing this research was that. Uh, the Weather Bureau actually began providing information to farmers in the southeastern United States, including North Carolina, as early as 1906. Uh, farmers could simply dial up, uh, call up Central, the, the local telephone office, and receive a weather report, which was, which was of, of great value to them. As near as I can tell, this was the earliest application of this in the whole U.S., that, that this uh, uh, Weather Bureau reporting by telephone as early as 1906. I know that the following year they began doing the same thing for the Midwest, but uh, it appears that the southeastern United States was uh, the first area that, that could receive weather reports by telephone, uh, individual farmers. That's so amazing. An early example of, of progressivism in, 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 in the early, early 20th century. Yeah, that's amazing. That seems, that feels like it's early for this. Uh you know, 1906, 1907, it, I'm almost surprised it's uh, it's quite that early. And this- they, they modified and enlarged upon it. Early on, you had to call into Central to find out what information the operator had. Uh, in 1911, they began a literal broadcast service where, and, and I know Southern Bell at the time was involved in that, where at a certain time of day, you could simply pick up your phone and there would be a broadcast weather report. And, and here again, this is in the southeastern United States, including North Carolina, that this happened. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. How long did this, do you know how long this uh, kind of service persisted? Uh, I don't know for sure. I'm sure that it lasted up until at least the 20s or 30s into the Depression era. Wow. That's really cool. So this, this information was impactful and, and was turned around to the use of farmers and, and I'm sure probably uh, shippers and uh, I imagine the military probably had its own uh, use for this information. 
That's fascinating stuff. Um, you mentioned a, a moment ago about the Weather Service contracting with a uh, with Marconi and other private um, contractors to deliver this weather information. And um, you know, I'm curious. This the weather the Weather Bureau here was launched as a as a government service as kind of a, a public uh, good. Mm -hmm. And we see even early on private enterprise uh, being involved in this. Uh, to what extent is there, was there then a conflict here between um, weather information and weather reporting as a, as a, a public good and, and as a private enterprise? Uh, this is also a debate that, that uh, came about uh, actually very early on in the establishment of, of, of the Weather Bureau, uh, whether this was a, pr a, pr a proper thing for the government to be doing or whether this is something that, that should be more properly done by private enterprise. Uh, and for that matter, even within the government, was it the responsibility of the military to do this or would it be more appropriate to put it under some other group such as the Department of Agriculture or later on the Department of Commerce? So. Uh, Basically, these, these are all political issues and they all have to do basically with who is the end user and who benefits. So early on, uh, General Meyer, Albert, Albert Meyer, who, who founded the, the, the signal service in 1870, saw the use of the, the military signal service to report weather as being a good way to put the, the signal corps to work during peacetime, uh, a good opportunity to, to shall we say, beat uh, uh, swords into plowshares to make use of, of military manpower and technology for, for the common good. Uh, and actually, there's, there are a lot of examples of that sort of thing happening. You, you can, uh, military applications that are put to civilian use. You think of the Army Corps of Engineers, for example, which has been around since the late 18th century, building dams and bridges and that sort of thing. And of course, the, the, the more recent example of putting military technology to civilian use is DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Group that uh, developed the internet technology that we are using at this moment. So there's a lot of examples of the military uh, taking their technology and putting it to civilian use. Uh, however, as I said, there, the whole issue is who benefits. So when it became apparent that the farmers uh, and, and other people who participated in agriculture were the beneficiaries of the weather service. And Congress decided in 1890, well, we'll move this weather service from the military and we will move it over to the Department of Agriculture since they're the ones that primarily benefit from it. And of course, the Department of Agriculture saw this as building their empire a little bit, uh, another service that they could provide. And the Department of Agriculture maintain that until well uh, into uh, the, the 20th century. And another user came along. In, in, in 1918, they began, the, the, the Weather Bureau began providing weather reports to the military for uh, airplane, for aeronautical uses uh, as, as military, as the military began to use airplanes. And of course, the, the, the airmail service began at about the same time. They also needed weather reports in order to schedule flights. So gradually you have uh, the, the airline industry, the aeronautical industry uh, becoming the primary user, uh, the being you, making use of, of the Weather Bureau information, the weather information. And so finally in 1940, they switched the Weather Bureau over to the Department of Commerce, which was responsible for the development of the, of the airline and aeronautical industry. And uh, that continued until the establishment of NOAA, uh, National Oceanic and, and Atmospheric Administration, and, and the National Weather Service in the 1970s. So yeah, there's uh, now to, to move on to the conflict between uh, uh, the government government sponsorship of, of the Weather Bureau and, and, and private industry. Uh, early on, the, the the, the telegraph companies were, would, would have been the logical people to try and, and maintain some sort of a weather reporting service, but they didn't see an opportunity to make any money out of it. They did not see that as being a, a profitable venture. So they, they uh, not only did they not get involved in weather reporting, uh, they rather grudgingly allowed the Weather Bureau to build their own telegraph lines. Now, Western Union complained a great deal about the fact that they were 
um, not that the use of airlines by the Weather Bureau was not uh, profitable enough. And they, they complained that the, the Weather Bureau was usurping their prerogatives by building their own telegraph lines. But uh, they, they never really got seriously involved in weather reporting. It wasn't until the 20th century and the, the early 21st century that you saw private companies begin to see a future in weather reporting and the ability to make it profitable. And you began to see things like weather.com, uh, the Weather Channel, and, and uh, the Weather Underground develop, who basically private organizations that provided different weather services, many of them internet based. So you, nowadays you, you are beginning to see some serious competition for uh, the, the, the weather reporting. Uh, we've got two questions here um, from our Facebook viewers. One is, and this is sort of relevant to this current question, will the weather service start to take the same steps as NASA and start using private companies to take up shortfalls in the future? Predicting the future is hard, but. I don't know if I would call that shortfalls, but you definitely you've got private companies that are going to compete with the, the weather service in the future to provide specialized services. Uh, when you, when you, you pick up your smartphone and you see that local weather reporting, uh, then that's a private company that is, that, is, that is doing that, probably doing that for you, uh, providing you a very localized weather report. Uh, and they can provide various other services that, that are very uh, specific to a given type of user. So, you know, there's, there's definitely an opportunity for private enterprise to get involved in that. And it's interesting, you know, to go back to that big data point, you know, weather today is absolutely yeah. big data, you know, crunching mm. material from satellites and ground stations and individual users reporting. And, and it is uh, fascinating to think of its humble origins um, in the weather service with telegraph mm. operators clicking mm. back and forth. Um, another of our viewers mentioned, uh, it's interesting that the Wright Brothers flight report was telegraphed from one of the Outer Banks weather stations, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great observation. Yeah, that was a Kitty Hawk weather station. Uh, and there's a, kind of a story behind the two. Uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright, um, located in Ohio in their bicycle shop, uh, were looking for a suitable location to test out some of their theories about flight, about whether or not you could make a, a heavier than air mach flying machine. And they figured the best way, best location to do that that was accessible to them would be somewhere on the Outer Banks where you have pretty steady, continuous winds. And they contacted a man by the name of Dosher, who was the telegraph operator at Kitty Hawk, at the Kitty Hawk weather station, and said, would it be, is, is this a suitable location for us to come out and try this, this experiment we have? And he said, yeah, it's, it's, this would be a great location, come on out. And uh, he, he basically stayed in touch with them. And when finally they were able to achieve uh, flight out there, they went running to the telegraph station to telegraph back to the folks in Ohio that they have been successful in, in, in uh, uh, sending that message there. In fact, I understand there's, there's some, uh, some, some stories floating around the Outer Banks about who actually was the first to report that by telegraph. And, and I think Dosher has the honor. He, was, he ran the station there at Kitty Hawk. There's uh, another fellow who evidently relayed it in, in Manio who claimed he was the one that sent the message. So you had a little bit of conflict about who, who, who deserves the glory for getting the word out to the world. And it's connections to the weather services. Uh, that's the important part. It's fascinating. Um, I have a few more questions. Uh, I guess we've been, obviously, we've been talking all about North Carolina in this story. Um, can you tell us briefly that the, this weather network that they were building at the time mm -hmm. um, extended well beyond North Carolina. Can you just fill us in a little bit about its reach? Yeah, the, the, the military signal service, uh, which was charged with, with building this weather network, actually it was, had, was chartered to build this network across the entire United States. Uh, the, era, the, the information on North Carolina I thought was particularly interesting, but it was, it was really a nationwide grid. And 
as early as 1870, they had 25 stations located across the U.S. It's worth noting that only two of them were in what we would call the Far West, in Omaha and Cheyenne. There's a reason for that. The telegraph, the transcontinental telegraph line that had been built in 1861 ran literally from Omaha west to San Francisco, and the, and the, the two major stations on that were, in fact, Omaha and Cheyenne, Wyoming. So those were the two earliest weather stations in the far west. They already were connected by telegraph. The rest of the, of the west was pretty sparsely populated then, and you're still dealing in the late 19th century with, with the, the Indian Wars, with the, the wars between the cavalry and the, the, the Native Americans of that region. And the Native Americans were well aware that the telegraph network out there could be used to summon troops and for military operations. So they would, they would uh, quite frequently burn down poles and, and disable the telegraph network to, to prevent the military from, from uh, uh, attacking them. Uh, they did, uh, the, the Weather Bureau also built uh, a network of stations and telegraph lines out in the West in that area. And here again, this is an area that Western Union didn't have much uh, infrastructure in because there's not a lot of money to be made if there's not a lot of people out there to send telegrams and so forth. So they, there's a similar story. And there's a man named James Schwab that wrote a book about the development of that network in, in the far West uh, a couple of years ago. A really interesting story of building and maintaining these weather stations in the West at a time when it was largely uninhabited and still a lot of Indian uh, Native American conflict going on. Thanks, that's an interesting story. Um, I wanna go back briefly to something you mentioned earlier that's, that's uh, you expressed your interest or your uh, pursuit of studying the role of women in this history and uh, can you tell us a little bit, I imagine World War II probably uh, brought forth the need to hire women to work in the weather service. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, uh, that aspect of the story? Yes, um, I could not find a lot of information on that, but a couple things do, do stand out. Uh, the, the head of the Weather Bureau at that time uh, of World War II was a man named Francis Reicheldurfer. And one of his initiatives during World War II was to hire more women. Of course, part of the reason was that many of the, the former male employees of the Weather Bureau, the weather observers and the weather techs were, were drafted into the military or, or were doing military work. So there was an opportunity for women to, to enter the, the, the Weather Bureau service during that time. And in fact, it appears that uh, the number of women employed by the Weather Bureau went from two in 1941 to over 900 by the end of the war. So a substantial number of women began to work for the Weather Bureau at that time. And of course, with, with things that have happened since then, the women's movement of the 70s and so forth, and the equal rights, uh, various the, the equal rights legislation that, is, that has taken place, you have a lot more women working for the Weather Bureau now. And if you go to the National Weather Service website, you'll see a lot of women working as, as, as uh, weather observers and weather techs in, in various locations. So, but that really began, as you say, in, with World War II and, and the, the big increase in, in the number of women working for the Weather Bureau. Thanks. I think I have just maybe one or two more questions for you. Um, I don't mean this as a trick question, but what's the future of weather? Well, uh, here again is- Or as weather, a, weather reporting, how about yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> in North Carolina. Yeah. As, as Niels Bohr once observed, it's uh, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. Uh, a couple of things you can look at. Uh, one is technology. Um, the, the, the article that I wrote, I basically ended with the 1980s and the adoption of, of, of weather radar, which uh, Doppler radar, which really eliminated the need for individual observers at, at local weather stations uh, because you had a much broader area uh, that you could cover with Doppler radar to see, to see weather fronts advancing and, and that sort of thing. The, the next big technological leap actually, I think, is satellite weather reporting, which gives you an even more global view and the ability to, to consolidate all this data together with, with vast increases in computing power and the ability to crunch all this data at a central location. The technology gives you a lot more uh, ability to, to 
to gather weather, predict trends, and, and in the future. However, there are some challenges. Uh, climate change. You know, the climate is changing, definitely, no question about it. The seas are rising, and this affects the weather. Uh, in, in, in locations like uh, the Outer Banks in North Carolina, as well as the rest of the world. So the, the big, one of the big challenges for the Weather Service is to incorporate this into their models and, and understand how to uh, uh, look at weather forecasting, how to, to best provide weather reporting, which is, and this is going to have a significant Im impact on the, the economy you look at what happens at eastern North Carolina when we have hurricanes, what this does to agriculture and, and, and similar areas. Another issue that, that, that came out very strongly working on this article, uh, at, at, at the time that these, these early stations were established on the Outer Banks, they were largely uninhabited. There weren't many people out there. Nowadays, there's a lot more uh, buildup of, of housing and, and a, a much higher population. Uh, the, the Outer Banks is a popular vacation destination. There's a lot of people living on the coast in various areas out there. So you now have a population moving into an area that uh, uh, formerly was, was, was not inhabited. And, and you need to look at the, uh, the impact that uh, the weather is going to have on those people. So you have this trade-off, you know, early on in, 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 in the 19th century, uh, you didn't have a lot of impact on infrastructure because there wasn't any with, when you had bad weather moving in. The main impact then was shipping. And that was, I think, one of the most valuable uh, uh, things that the Weather Service provided then was the ability to let ships know what kind of weather they were going to sail into off the coast. Well, uh, that's been pretty well taken care of. Uh, we can do that quite well with, with ship to shore radio and that sort of thing today. But you have the weather impact on the infrastructure out there is going to be much greater in the future. And that's the challenge that the Weather Service has to, uh, has to deal with, how to provide appropriate weather warnings for people. When should we evacuate? What are we going to have an impact on the economy? And so on and so forth. So it's greater challenges, ahead, certainly. Sure. Uh, uh, this is Jeff. This has been fascinating. And I, of course, it, encourage everybody uh, who's watching to, to go find and, and read the article. What are we going to hear next from you? What, what are you pursuing these days? Well, what I'm working on now, and it's uh, actually uh, uh, directly related to, to the research I did, I, I became quite curious about what happened with the wireless business uh, after, after Fessenden left the area and, and, and the, the wireless business went elsewhere. Quite a bit, actually. North Carolina became a real hotbed of competition for developing wireless, not only for ship-to-shore radio on the coast, but uh, also for communication among inland cities. There's a, a company called United Wireless that wanted to build stations all over North Carolina uh, to, to provide communication. So there was a lot of competition to, to build a wireless network. And, and this is wireless telegraphy back in the state. You didn't even have the ability to send voice or music. It was just simply wireless Morse code. Uh, but it turned out to be a total stock fraud and the head of the United Wireless Company was, was put in jail. So, so there's an, a, quite an interesting story about the development of early wireless in North Carolina. And one very interesting and intriguing story that I ran across. When I went to, uh, when I went to see Jamie Lanier, who is the archivist at the, the National Park Service in Manio, uh, to show me these telegrams that were stuffed in the walls of the weather station at Hatteras, she also showed me what appeared to be a log entry uh, detailing the message sent by the Titanic when it sank in 1912. Now, was it really received at the Hatteras weather station? Probably not, because they didn't have wireless equipment. But there was a wireless station just down the road uh, in Buxton run by Marconi. So the, to, to find the provenance of this entry has is, is, is been one real interesting challenge. And I've talked to a number of people about it. There are still legends floating around the, the outer banks from some of the older folks about the, the receiving the, the, the message from the Titanic in 1912. And I'm, I'm hoping to be able to find out a bit more about that in the future. Well, that's terrific. We look forward to hearing more. Well, Tom, I want to thank you for your time today. This has been a, a great conversation, and uh, I really appreciate you 
spending some time with me today and, and sharing this uh, with all of our, our viewers today. Thank you for the opportunity. I've enjoyed it. Excellent. Take care, uh, everybody. We uh, will do another one of these uh, in about a month, and we look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks.